So Mike, Mike has been doing really interesting stuff. And the first time I came across his work was in 2007, when I was supposed to review his IPSN work on Gaussian processes for tidal wave predictions or something like this. I didn't know you were a reviewer on that paper, Mark. That's interesting. Yeah, it was an interesting paper. Yeah, right. <laughs> So, so the one time I accepted his paper. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, but uh, Mike, Mike was in this Aladdin project, and he's been like in a lot of projects with, with Steve, uh, Steve Roberts. But so Mike is, I think, generally interested in Bayesian thinking, and he's a really nice guy, which is uh, <laughs> <laughs> that is independent of the Bayesian thinking. So Mike, uh, Mike also like. Recently, for well, the last n years, looked into Bayesian optimization, and then also I think together with Philip moved into this probabilistic numerics thing. So therefore, I really think this should have been a tandem talk. Um, <laughs> so it was interrupted by coffee breaks. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah, I leave it. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me and putting on such a wonderful day. So I would like to start out with an appeal. So essentially, this is a very new talk. It was conceived yesterday. The birthing process finished uh, about three hours ago. So I'd like you to think of it as a newborn child. So you may, at various points, notice that its skull is a bit misshapen. <laughs> its hair may be a little bit irregular. But I'd like, to, I'd like you to overlook that as much as possible for the true inner beauty that it possesses within. So with that proviso out of the way, the topic of the talk is probabilistic numerics, and in particular its connection to Bayesian optimization, which of course has been the topic of the day. Uh, fortunately, Philip has also has already introduced us to probabilistic numerics, but I thought I'd give my own definition, which is that it treats computation as a decision, meaning that we bring the full framework of decision theory to any numerical computation that our uh, algorithms might be performing. So this has some interesting consequences. Uh, to highlight exactly what this way of thinking means for optimization, consider the Rosenbrock. So a very common test function in optimization. Perhaps you've used it in tests you've performed for Bayesian optimization. But check it out. So this is its functional form in its two-dimensional form. You can write it out using 17 characters. I counted earlier. Right? So it's not, it's not very complicated. Um, nonetheless, it does have some interesting properties as an optimization test problem. It's got this value, which is quite difficult to explore along for many algorithms. But the interesting thing is that it's known in any sense of the word. This is a known function, right? You can evaluate it quickly, and you can determine more or less its entire analytic properties by in in uh, inspecting its functional form. So why then would it make sense to put a probability distribution on its value at a particular x, y pair. And of course, I raise that question because that's exactly what we do in Bayesian optimization. We put a prior on this function. And that prior expresses the fact that we are, in some senses, uncertain about it, which is a little bit odd, given how simple this thing is and how well known it is. So um, don't worry. There is an answer to the question of why we do that. And I'll do my best to provide it. The reason that it makes sense to treat something that's as well known as the Rosenbrock as unknown and putting a prior upon it is because we have a finite computational budget. So the whole point of optimization is that um, you know, we, we can't expend an infinite amount of computational resource. If we could, we could do a grid search. And you know, here's a demonstration of performing a grid search for the Rosenbrock, uncovering the true global minimum there. Um, but of course, even for the Rosenbrock, that grid search might not be feasible given the resources we have. So in the presence of a finite amount of computation, we're inevitably going to be forced to not evaluate this function at all the points we might be interested in. We're going to have to infer some uh, functional values given other function values which have been observed. And really, that's the thread that runs throughout probabilistic numerics. It says that in the presence of a finite computational budget, we're going to have to use the things we have been able to afford to reason about the things we haven't. And given a loss function, given a specification of what we're trying to achieve in performing this numerical goal, how can we best allocate that finite computational budget? 
Those are the broad themes which I'd like to return throughout the rest of the talk. Um, right, so <laughs> this is exactly what I've just said, made concrete in the example of Bayesian optimization. So it's entirely legitimate, illegitimate for it to be, us to be epistemically uncertain about a function given the budgets we, uh, budget we can afford for its computation. That's exactly what we see in Bayesian optimization. We've seen many pictures of this form throughout the day. We use our prior as a means of uh, optimally allocating the finite budget for computation we have. So, you know, the Gaussian process prior describes the epistemic uncertainty we have about the function at various points, and then it then allows us to define an acquisition function or expected loss, which allows us to choose where we might next best assign the computation of the function. Okay, so that was my couple of minute introduction to probabilistic numerics. A lot of the rest of the talk is going to be um, thinking about Bayesian optimization for learning. And by learning, I mean the optimization of a, a model. So this is not perhaps a universally accepted definition of the word, but you do see this distinction made between inference, which is about averaging over models, and learning, which is optimization of models. It's that definition in particular I'm going to be using. It's very common in machine learning and probabilistic inference, uh, computational statistics more broadly. Essentially, learning comes up whenever we have model parameters that are unknown a priori. So the example I keep coming back to, and one in fact that was drawn from that IPSN paper from 2008 that Mark reviewed, was uh, the inference about tides. So. Um, the setting here was that we had a sensor network deployed off the coast of Southampton, taking readings of things like tide heights at uh, kind of a 15 minute um, uh, frequency. So the problem was that every now and again these sensors would fail, we wouldn't get readings from them due to things like storms, and as such we would have to do inference, we would have to do prediction for what the tide heights were even in the absence of those readings from the sensors. And of course to do that accurately, we needed to do um, some kind of learning or inference of what the period of this function would be. So it's clearly uh, quasi-periodic to some extent. It's not perfectly periodic. But it's important for us to be able to get that period right if we're to do really effective extrapolation into the future when we don't have the observations we will want. So for this kind of model, um, we end up with a log likelihood surface which looks a little bit like this. Concretely, the parameter of the model is the log of the period for this quasi-periodic model. That's what's on the x-axis. The log likelihood, which is a measure of the quality of the model fit, is on the y-axis. Um, as Mark said, I'm a Bayesian to my core, so I will continue to plot log likelihoods on this axis, but most of what I'm going to say for the rest of the talk, you could reinterpret, if you like, as being about minimizing cross-validation loss or whatever horrible frequentist, non-Bayesian approach you might like to choose. <laughs> By either of those measures of model quality, we're going to get a surface that looks like this. That is, the true period, which is about half a day, uh, appears as a big peak. There are, however, these kind of additional modes corresponding to harmonics of the true period. So this is the log period, which is why they don't appear evenly spaced on the plot. You can see there they are out to the right. But we also have all this horrible behavior between those peaks and below the, um, the true period corresponding to harmonics of the sampling frequency. So we get all these horrible spikes. All this by way of saying that learning for this problem is not actually as trivial as you might think. This is a horrible multimodal noisy function um, and is something to which we would want to bring to bear you know, the most sophisticated machinery we have for optimization. So, um, right, uh, in particular, optimization is going to require us not just to hone in on our initial starting guess, which in this setting would lead us into disaster, but to really do this kind of balancing of exploration and exploitation that we've spent most of the day talking about. So here is an illustration of doing exactly that in this setting. If we fit a Gaussian process to this log likelihood surface, um, it allows us to you know, represent the true uncertainty we should possess about regions of the space we haven't yet uh, evaluated and then 
to use that uncertainty to drive our evaluation of future uh, function values. Now, I want to return to that point I made earlier about the Rosenbrock being unknown in the context of Bayesian optimization. And it might have struck you as a slightly artificial sort of example. I mean, you know, yes, the Rosenbrock is known, but the kind of things I deal with aren't known, you might be thinking. And so actually it is entirely reasonable to bring Bayesian optimization to bear on my problems, even if it wouldn't be for the Rosenbrock. But just to hammer my point home and to isolate what the um, insight behind probabilistic numerics is. So this likelihood surface is itself known. I mean, so the likelihood in this sense is a bit of code. It doesn't actually have to be very long. It's certainly not stochastic, it's deterministic. And um, again, in some senses, it's a little bit weird that we're bringing probabilistic inference to bear on the optimization of this well-known function, right? But again, the motivation is the fact that it's expensive to evaluate. So for a likelihood, we'd normally have to evaluate the quality of the model fit by scanning over the entire data set that we're trying to fit, or at least some well-chosen subsets of it. And as such, we can't imagine doing that for all possible settings of our parameters. We're going to, make sure, we're going to want to make sure that they're concentrated in the most sensible locations. Um, another important point I'd like to make and I'm not sure I'll have the chance to return to this in the depth I would like, is that yes, in probabilistic numerics, we're treating the objective as unknown, but we're not treating it as completely unknown. So in the context of this likelihood surface, note that the covariance function I've chosen expresses that notion of smoothness, as well it should, because indeed this likelihood is a smooth function of that log period. But there's a wide range of other properties of this objective function I might want to bring into my probabilistic numeric Bayesian optimization procedure to achieve better results. And one really exciting avenue for future research in probabilistic numerics, I think, is digging precisely into the structure of the source code of the um, functions we're trying to optimize. So for this likelihood, I mean, it's not very visible at this resolution, but some of the parameters are hidden within uh, our if statements. So the relevance of some parameters is conditional on the value of other parameters. It's exactly this kind of conditional dependence that Nando was mentioning in his talk earlier. So wouldn't it be wonderful if we could automatically inspect this code and use that to design the optimization procedure? So that's what probabilistic numerics affords us. It's the ability to bring in is just as much prior information as we need to solve the problem. That is, we can't bring in the knowledge of the entire function because we can't possibly imagine evaluating at every single point, but perhaps we can bring in these kind of aggregate properties that are useful for its optimization, things like the relevance of some parameters conditional on the values of others. Okay, so now on to a particular application of Bayesian optimization for learning. In particular, Bayesian optimization for stochastic learning. Um, and I should, of course, acknowledge the many different people who have contributed to this, this work. So Mark McLeod, Tom Nixon, Steve Reese, and Steve Roberts, all in the machine learning group in, uh, in Oxford. So just to be crystal clear about what we're trying to do here, and I apologize for the kind of cartoon that I threw together in about half an hour yesterday, but hopefully it makes the point. So return to this idea of trying to find the best possible period for a quasi-periodic model fitted to some periodic data. So here's the data. Those are the little orange dots you can see. The idea behind stochastic optimization or stochastic variational inference is that actually we can't afford to look at the entire data set at any point in time. We're going to have to use batches of data. So what does that mean in the setting I've just described? It would mean evaluating the goodness of a setting of a period for different subsets of the data. So each of these three different plots contains a slightly different subset of some quasi-periodic function. And I've evaluated two different um, Gaussian process posteriors associated with two different settings for that quasi-period, quasi or the, the actual period, I should say. So you can see the kind of green Gaussian process if you use your imagination and pretend that's a Gaussian process. 
corresponds to a relatively short setting for that parameter, expressing that there is actually some sort of quasi-periodicity there that we can learn from. The yellow Gaussian process essentially says that the quasi-period is very, very long, and hence there's not really any structure here that we're learning from. And what I've plotted over on the right is the likelihood of those two possible settings for the period for those three different subsets of data. So you can see if we choose this subset, it does indeed look like there's some periodicity, and hence the likelihood of the parameter that uh, expresses the, that sort of length scale of periodicity is high, while the long period is, lo uh, is low. Whereas for other subsets, we might get, um, you know, the long period looking really good and the short period looking bad. The point I'm trying to make here is that when we start taking subsets of the data, the observations of likelihood we get out are noisy, which is interesting because the framework we're using, Bayesian optimization, is entirely capable of dealing with noisy observations. Having brought this framework of probabilistic inference to bear, throwing in a bit more uncertainty due to um, this noise in the likelihood is really not a problem. Again. I apologize for the cartoon. In fact, we've seen much better pictures of noisy optimization <laughs> earlier in the day. But my point is just this is really not an issue at all. We can do Bayesian optimization with noisy uh, ev evaluations of the objective function, which is great for us because what it means is that if we do make these noisy evaluations of the likelihood by using subsets of data, we can use Bayesian optimization to affect stochastic learning. So I hope that's clear. Um, so we tried this idea out last year in the form of an algorithm known as STOAT for stochastic algorithm tuning. And that's not the world's best acronym. There are some better ones coming up later in the talk, if you'll bear with me. So the general idea here was that, um, yeah, we're going to do exactly this kind of stochastic optimization of models. But the particular problem we found ourselves facing is that if any one of these likelihood evaluations is relatively uninformative, that is if it's corrupted by quite a lot of noise due to it being associated with the evaluation on a very small subset of the original data, we're going to need a lot of those noisy likelihood evaluations. So in doing Bayesian optimization over those noisy likelihood evaluations, we had to bring sparse GPs to bear or approximate GP inference. So a lot of this work was just dedicated to doing a review of different methods of GP, well, approximate GP inference. And the end result, after Tom had spent a lot of time in tests of these different approaches, was actually um, that a spectral approach worked best. That is, we identified a subset of points in the space which we wanted to do prediction on, evaluated the gram matrix over those points, and then approximately constructed an uh, truncated eigen decomposition of the covariance function, which allowed us to get sort of much better than order n cubed um, evaluations of the likelihood. So it was order nm squared as usual. The other things we tested out worked less well for various reasons. So the random forests didn't work so well due to the kind of poorly calibrated uncertainty estimates. Uh, the Laplacian approach, which was the work of Simo Sarkar and Arno Solon, um, very similar, in fact, to the approach we ended up favoring, also didn't work well. The differences between them are relatively subtle. Um, so in this approach, the spectral decomposition that was chosen was closed form, but required the specification of boundary conditions that, in the end, led to some artifacts at the boundaries that led to some undesirable behavior. Maybe not an important point. Anyway, so in the end, we uh, worked with this spectral decomposition approach that gave us this much superior scaling with a number of points and did enable us to do this kind of stochastic learning with large numbers of noisy likelihood evaluations. <coughs> right, so now onto two tests. The first is not stochastic learning. It's just going to be an evaluation of how this algorithm works for the optimization of a noisy function. So in particular, we took the well-known Brannan function and corrupted it by Gaussian noise with quite a large variance, variance 5. And um, we compared against what you would do uh, with standard Bayesian optimization. 
And we also tested it out against the CMAES, I forget what that stands for, Covariance Matrix Adaptation Evolution Research, I think. Strategies. Strategies, thanks. This kind of horrible, random evolutionary approach. It didn't converge, so we can rule that one out. Um, we budgeted by permitting both, well, sorry, all of our techniques a finite amount of computation, which I would argue in most of these settings is really what we want to do. And in the end, surprise, surprise, our technique seemed to deliver some benefits. Now we're to a test to actually reveal the uh, value of this kind of algorithm tuning. So um, I was working on a project called ORCID, one of whose tasks was to try and design a method to predict the energy usage of households across the UK. Uh, so here are some traces of what that energy usage looks like for a bunch of different households. The x-axis is time, this is a single day. Um, the point is that the data is quite noisy and as a result the kind of likelihood evaluations we were getting out were quite noisy as well. So we knew that energy consumption was likely to be periodic, just like the tidal signal that I showed before. That is, people tend to use more power during the day than at night. But it wasn't entirely clear from the data what the period should be. So yes, there's a daily period, but also there are likely to be seasonal periodicities, maybe weekly periodicities. It wasn't clear which of those trends was the most important. So before we came along, the <coughs> designers of this system were restricted to just learning a single period which best matched the data that they had. And um, given the kind of computational budget they could afford, uh, they weren't doing a particularly good job in restricting themselves to that single period. We were able to learn a model that captured two periods by spending our computation more wisely. That is, we were only evaluating the likelihood on a subset of the full 30,000 evaluations, 30,000 data sorry, I should say, thereby allowing us, allowing us to explore many different um, parameter settings much more efficiently and giving us much better prediction at the end of the day. So that was that. Now onto some uh, work in progress that I'm even more excited about. So the really exciting thing about doing stochastic learning is that you can really bring this insight of probabilistic numerics about optimal allocation of computation to bear in that larger subsets of data are associated with a greater computational expense. So really what you want to do is to be using the framework of decision theory to optimally select those batch sizes, the size of the subsets of data over which you're evaluating. And the plot here illustrates us doing exactly that. So of course to do this we need to define what the computational expense of a particular batch size is. Um, for this particular setting, we were choosing, um, I, I guess really the question is how the variance of the valuation of the likelihood you get out is related to the um, size of the subset. I mean, if you only have one parameter, it's easy to optimize it. You need to find the trade-off parameter between the variance of the likelihood and the expense of evaluating that um, subset. So we're going to choose a noise standard deviation which is proportional to one over the square of the subset size and running your algorithm forwards, which is over time varying the size of that subset according to what it sees to be the most optimal allocation, we are able to do better than the benchmark we chose, which was the predictive entropy search that Matt spoke about earlier. So um, in case it wasn't clear, the, the setting here was exactly a Gaussian process uh, model tuning problem where we were trying to choose the hyperparameters of a GP fitted to 50 data points given likelihood evaluations on subsets. So this to me is the most exciting thing for Bayesian optimization for algorithm tuning and for probabilistic numerics in general moving forwards, the application of decision theory to really tune where that computation should be assigned. Okay, so moving right along. Um, now into another piece of work in progress. This is joint with Javier, who you've probably met throughout the week, and Neil. And it's trying to tackle the problem of uh, multi-step look-ahead. So almost all approaches to global optimization are myopic in the sense of only considering the impact of the next function value in considering where we should go. 
you're only ever looking one function value into the future. So to our minds, that's inherently suboptimal. And to illustrate a setting in which it's clearly so, imagine we're trying to optimize a function over this 1D interval. So if we took a myopic approach to optimization, and assuming we knew nothing at all about this function a priori, we'd probably specify the first evaluation at the center of the interval. So fair enough, right? I mean, that's the evaluation that's going to give us the best global information about this function if we really did only have one evaluation. But of course, if we actually had two evaluations, having sunk the first evaluation in the middle means that we're going to be forced to spend the second either in the middle of this half or that half. And you can see either way we're going to end up with a pair of samples that's far from optimally spaced across this interval. So the true problem we're trying to solve here, I've tried to illustrate in this um, Bayes net, and I should say obviously that this is exactly the problem that David was speaking about earlier, wherever David's gone, the kind of multi-point problem. So we are an agent who currently has a data set D0, and we're trying to decide where we should place our next evaluation. And I'm going to call that evaluation X star. Associated with X star is the function value that's returned, that's Y star. And including both of those bits of information and whatever data we had previously, we'll define a new data set, D1. And then with that information, with that data set, we're going to make the next decision about where to evaluate, X2. That will then result in another function value returned, Y2. Both of those bits of information will get incorporated into a data set D2, which will inform our next decision, and so on, and so on, and so on. You can see from this Bayes net just how big a challenge this problem is. So if I wanted to uh, find the best possible setting for X star, and that's indeed exactly what I want to do, I need to marginalize over Y star, then optimize over what X2 would be. That is, consider what the best possible setting for X2 would be having received that particular Y star, and then do another marginalization over what the function value Y2 would be at that point, and then do another maximization over what X3 would be, and so on and so forth. So basically, for every step we want to look further into the future, we get a nested optimization marginalization or optimization integration pair. So this is as extraordinarily complex as you can imagine to solve numerically. Um, right, so in our recent work, we're going to bring somewhat of a probabilistic numeric flavor to solving this problem. We're going to say, well, actually it's, so these actions x2, x3, x4 are those of my future self those that the agent uh, described by my source code is going to execute in the future given these observations that it will have received that I don't currently have. So in some sense that again is a weird thing to be uncertain about because I know I'm going to just do the optimal thing given the information I've seen in those future time steps. But the probabilistic num numeric view would be to kind of marginalize over those future actions probabilistic numeric view here is actually going to treat the actions of my future self as uncertain, which is, you know, kind of an interesting thing to do. Um, but in particular, we're going to break a lot of those links in the full problem in an approximation that actually allows us to make some headway on this, this very numerically challenging problem. So essentially what we're going to put is a joint distribution over all the future function valuations I'm ever going to make. So I'm going to say I'm going to forget this knowledge I have about me being a rational agent who's going to optimize those locations. Instead, I'm going to put a joint probability distribution over all those future uh, function evaluation locations. And then, of course, I'm still going to have to possess a joint probability distribution over what the function values are going to be at those locations. So the interesting thing here is this distribution, the distribution over what I'm going to do in the future. And before I can talk about what that distribution is likely to be, let's talk about the second distribution, the distribution over the function values themselves. 
So that, of course, as with much of the discussion in the rest of the day, is going to be a Gaussian process. So imagine we were optimizing the six hump camel function. Here it is in all its glory on the left. It's got two uh, global minima. But imagine we'd only taken a finite set of evaluations of that up to the current point in time. Those are the little colored dots. The contours here are the posterior mean of the Gaussian process surrogate fitted to those observations. So the question is, given this Gaussian process, where would it make sense for me to evaluate in future? And here's our answer to that question. So note that more precisely, the question I want to answer is conditional on my selection of the next function evaluation, the next location, what is the distribution over all future evaluations beyond that? So here's an idea about what those evaluations might look like. The black stars correspond to <coughs> my choice of where the next function evaluation will be. The white stars correspond to kind of the mode, if you like, of a distribution over where the second and third evaluations beyond that might be. So if I schedule an evaluation here, it's reasonable to think that my next two evaluations after that, sorry, I should say that the contours here correspond to the myopic uh, expected improvement acquisition function. So these contour lines correspond to EI just as you might expect. So having plonked down a, an evaluation here, probably my next two evaluations are going to go um, explore these modes of the EI uh, acquisition function. Similarly, if I plonk down a function value um, down here, I'm going to put uh, future evaluations at those modes. But crucially, I'm also going to spread them out a little bit because I know that there's not going to be much value in just putting all my future evaluations at the current best point. I know that my future self is sensible. Um, that agent is going to spread out the evaluations so as to best learn about the space. And that's exactly what we can see in this kind of mechanism. Um, if I put a function value at what is pretty close to the current best point, the maximizer of the acquisition function, note then that the future function values are pushed away. So the white stars are now pushed out much closer towards the edges. <coughs> I'm not going to say too much about how this distribution over um, future function values is obtained. Our original hope was to do that with the determinantal point process, which if you know about DPPs captures exactly what we're trying to do here. That is that those future function values are going to be concentrated by the means of incorporation of a quality term into the DPP uh, around points where the current acquisition function is high, but they're also going to be dissimilar to one another. They're going to be pushed away because of the fact that my agent is rationally <coughs> trying to explore the space. OK, so this slide has kind of illustrated how we might put a probability distribution over where my future function values might be. We can then use that distribution to define a new acquisition function, a multi-step look-ahead acquisition function, which represents the impact of this uncertainty about those future function values. So let's dive into some representations of that. So um, remember the shape here. This is the myopic or one-step acquisition function. This is the two-step acquisition function, the two-step expected loss, which is now reflecting the impact of those future function values. So you can see it's a bit more diffuse than the one-step. And as I zoom forwards, this is now three steps. It's yet more diffuse. And note that it's starting to put a bit more weight um, uh, out towards the edges, as you might hope. If you've got a few more function values to spend, you probably would want to spend at least some of them at the edges, characterizing the entire space. And as I zoom forwards yet further, through 5 and 10 and 20, you can see that diffusion continuing. Um, you can also see, if you're observant, that the expected loss, which is what we're plotting here, is dropped. So you can see that given more steps into the future, I am able to reasonably expect to do better than I would do given just a single evaluation into the future. And we also get this much more interesting sort of fractal surface, um, which leads us to kind of exploit more structure that might exist in this function than we would do given just a single look-ahead step into the future. 
Uh, we're certainly going to be doing a lot more exploration of this function in light of the fact that we know we have more function values beyond just the next one. So the most interesting experiments for me to do with this kind of approach are not to set a single fixed look ahead for all time in doing Bayesian optimization. Because in fact what we want to do is to reduce that look ahead as we get closer to the end of our run. right? And that's exactly the experiments that Javier has generously run. So imagine we've got a budget of 25 evaluations of our objective. Now, when we've already taken 23, we obviously want to do no more than two-step look-ahead. So that's how our approach is going to work in this setting. We're going to up bound the look-ahead we enforce by the number of evaluations remaining. Um, the different methods against which we've compared are the columns here. So this is expected loss or expected improvement, the myopic approach. GL2 is our approach for two-step look-ahead. GL3 is three-step look-ahead and so on and so forth. I've just realized I don't think I described the wonderful acronym we have for this algorithm. I apologize. GLASSES stands for global, oh, let me go back to it before I forget. <laughs> I put a lot of work into this acronym. There we go. Global optimization with look ahead through stochastic simulation and expected loss search. So applause, please, I think. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Actually, one of the best acronyms that I've ever come up with. Anyway, sorry. Thank you for indulging me. Um, anyway, back to the results. Uh, we tested over these five different uh, test functions in 10 tests. The results here are the median of those 10 tests. And it does indeed seem that we can improve upon myopic uh, look ahead by you know, entertaining the possibility of looking a little bit further into the, the future. Results are still forthcoming. We'll see if we can't uh, improve upon this. So, yeah. OK, uh, I've already spoken for 35 minutes, which is a bit alarming. Let's see if I can get through this next paper in a little bit more rapid uh, manner. So we've heard already today about the problem of doing optimization in very high numbers of dimensions. And the approach that was described to us was known as REMBO, which adopts a random embedding, which is, of course, a very sensible thing to do in some sense. And indeed, there are very impressive results that have been returned by that procedure. But to someone familiar with the probabilistic numeric framework, you might question the choice of a random embedding. So remember that I defined numerical computation as being the result of a decision. And if you think of it that way, it becomes very uh, alarming to introduce stochasticity. Because what loss function, what expected loss function, is a stochastic choice the answer to? Right? If we view this numerical process as taking a decision about where to allocate computation, why would I make any component of that decision random or stochastic? Inherently, that is not going to result in a decision at the highest um, expected, sorry, highest expected utility or lowest expected loss, no matter what that loss or utility function is. So with that kind of, Matt looks pretty upset by that. Adversarial situations. OK, but this is not an adversarial oh, situation. You asked for win and OK, win. fair enough, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or even then, I, I'll try not to get sidetracked too much. Even in an adversarial situation, I think what you should really be doing is um, describing a probabilistic model over your adversary. I think you should be reasoning about that adversary. Anyway, we're going to get sidetracked. Let's well, let's move on. You have many local optimum and so on, so uncertainty arises, and that's why you pick the mix. Right. So if you're uncertain, you should represent that uncertainty, define a loss function associated with what you're trying to do, and then minimize the expected loss. Mm -hmm. Right, but you still define a stochastic policy. But why? Why make the decisions in a random way? Why not minimize an expected loss? Is, well, is that so far? Admitting... No, there's a difference between probabilistic reasoning and stochastic decision making. There's no reason that I should introduce a pseudo random number generator into a procedure which is trying to perform a deterministic calculation. Right, but I don't see how in the way you're interpreting RAMBA as being decisions that are. I mean, what Rem is basically doing is Johnson, Linda, Strauss. It's just mm. you have a distance, you have inner products in one space, and you can project it to another space, and in that space, 
those inner products are preserved. You know, mm. you have the, the hyperloop of it. Yeah, but, but that's I not should a decision. That's just a transformation the of the problem. <laughs> I mean, you, th there is a decision made in using a pseudo-random number generator. The decision is the output of that pseudo-random number generator. And the question is, why is that particular value that's returned by that generator any better than any of the others you could choose? And if it's not better than any of the others you could choose, then you've actually wasted computation in using a pseudo-random number generator because it's not free. I mean, you, might, you could have picked anything. You could have picked the lowest limit or the upper limit. I, this is I don't understand. I, I really don't understand what you mean. Hmm. Um, you transform the problem to another problem, and, and, and it's justified by the Johnson Linden trust theory, basically, uh, in its serious form. Do I, I, where why, I, why is that not reasonable to transform a problem to another one it's if what you care is about the distances? The, the it's distances. reasonable to, to perform the transformation. It's not reasonable to solve the problem using any kind of stochasticity. It's not reasonable to solve a problem that is about numerical computation with a pseudo-random number generator. And there's a much longer conversation we could have here about the, uh, you know, the inadequacies of, inadequacies of Monte Carlo. But right, but, but we know um, that if you're in a computer volume of an object in high dimensions, mm. you, Monte Carlo will give you a polynomial time algorithm. Mm. Just if you have an oracle that tells you whether you're inside a convex body or outside. Mm. But we also know, um, by means of theorem, that non-deterministic algorithm um, can even approximate that in time that is sub-exponential. I, I would say so if there's this... there's impossibility theorems for deterministic algorithms compared to randomized algorithms. I, I would it's say... A classical result in... By definition, if there's something that a randomized algorithm can do, something that exploits structure about the problem is going to do better something that actually incorporates knowledge about the smoothness of the problem is going to <coughs> outperform that. I, maybe we should discuss this later, Nando. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or milk, yeah. Um, anyway, so we were inspired basically by Nando's work to see if we couldn't uh, tackle this problem of learning embeddings in a non-random way. And in particular, the tool we wanted to bring to bear was that of um, active learning or active inference. So here is a problem uh, just like the ones Nanda was speaking about earlier, which has low intrinsic dimension. So its extrinsic dimension is 2. It looks like it's a function of two dimensions, x2 and x1. But actually, it turns out it's only the variation along this line that matters for the value of the function. So uh, let's imagine that this set of functions is sufficiently general to be of interest some quick maths to define exactly what I mean. Imagine that our function is equal to another function of a lower dimensional u. So u is of lower dimension than x. If we put a gp onto um, f tilde with a covariance function k tilde, we end up with a gp for f, uh, a covariance function with covariance function kappa, which is just the original covariance function k kappa with the linear transformation expressed by u applied to the inputs. So all that by way of saying that we can express that our um, function is of lower intrinsic dimension than is immediately obvious by using a Mahalanobis distance in the place of what would be an ARD distance. Uh, this is not a very interesting mathematical property, but it is true. If you had taken a covariance function uh, tilde kappa, which just had the, well, an isotropic covariance function, you would end up with the Mahanobis covariance function over the original f. So this is an interesting way to think about the problem, because what it says, if I'm trying to actively learn about an embedding, it's exactly the same thing about as trying to learn about the input scales um, of a standard GP, except I've kind of generalized to having this full Mahalanobis distance in the place of you know, the usual ARD input scales. But in 1D, the two approaches are exactly the same, learning input scales, learning and embedding. <coughs> so with that intuition in mind, let's look at a series of 1D examples. In particular, one task we're going to have to perform here is the incorporation of uncertainty 
in the hyperparameters. So remember, our goal was to try and actively learn about an embedding. That embedding is that matrix R. And if we're to actively learn, we need to put some prior over what that embedding is. So we're going to put a prior on R, and then what we want to do is to propagate the uncertainty in that embedding through to the uncertainty in the function values. So the naive way of doing that would be some kind of sampling. You might sample over those high parameters, specifying the embedding matrix R, so as to arrive at a posterior for the function. That, of course, is vastly expensive, particularly given the high dimension of R in this case. So if we're mapping from capital D dimensions down to little d dimensions, um, we need D times D hyperparameters to specify the embedding. So there are really a lot of hyperparameters going along here, around here. So we needed some efficient way of doing this marginalization over hyperparameters to give us a posterior for the function which had kind of captured that uncertainty. And we introduced this neat little trick known as the marginal GP or MGP to solve exactly that problem. So if you haven't looked in the MGP, it might be useful in many other settings as well. The problem it solves is that approximate marginalization of GP hyperparameters. We found it useful in a bunch of different settings. Um, here's what it looks like in practice. So imagine we had uh, a GP fitted to these four points, the four dots. The GP would get out of just taking the map hyperparameters, so in particular the map input scales, is represented in blue. But of course, if we just take the map hyperparameters, we're underrepresenting our true uncertainty because we wouldn't be capturing the uncertainty due to the uncertainty in the input scales. We'd have just set them to the map values. So our MGP inflates the posterior variance of the Gaussian process to accommodate that additional uncertainty due to the uncertainty in the input scales. So you can see the MGP in red has slightly inflated error bars relative to the blue. And the inflation is greater in exactly the region, regions you might expect, um, out here away from the observations. Um, right, so the bottom bit of the plot talks about what we're ultimately going to do with this posterior. In particular, we're going to use it to drive active sampling. In fact, the type of active sampling we performed was exactly what is done in entropy search. It uses mutual information as a loss function. What we're going to do is to choose the location on this function to evaluate that um, maximizes the mutual information with the hyperparameters we're trying to learn about. And remember, in the higher dimensional case, those hyperparameters are going to be those that specify the embedding. So the expected loss functions are described in these three different curves down here, the, the mutual information between the input scale and the function value. And you can see that if we were to just take the map hyperparameters, the maximizer of that loss function is going to be very different from what we would get by either exhaustively sampling over the hyperparameters or using our MGP approximation both of which would induce us to select more or less the same point. So I want to run through some plots that illustrate how this progresses. So remember, our challenge here is to learn about the high parameters of a GP. And um, in the high dimensional case, those high parameters are going to be those specifying the embedding. In this 1D case, they're going to be those specifying the input scale. So this inset plot here is the posterior over that input scale. You can see, to begin with, it's very diffuse. Uh, the black dot is obviously the first evaluation we start with, in light of which we've produced this um, map GP as well as the MGP in red. So the question is, where, we sh where should we evaluate next? I haven't shown the loss function, but in fact, we end up selecting a point that's quite some distance away, which makes sense. The posterior over the high parameter tightens up a bit. As I zoom forwards, notice what happens. So the posterior tightens up over time, and we end up with a sampling schedule that is kind of logarithmically spaced over the domain, which is exactly what you might have expected. That is, we want some observations that are very close together and some observations that are very far away from each other so that we can best lock down exactly what the input scale in this space would be. If we only had observations that were kind of 
evenly spaced, we would have a much more diffuse distribution over what that input scale could be. So if that's clear, now I can go back to the kind of high dimensional setting. Here's that, um, sorry, I should have introduced bald, which is exactly that mutual information loss function. Here's that two dimensional function I flashed up at the start. And we're going to compare the observations we make through this kind of active learning procedure in black against those we would have made by uncertainty sampling, where uncertainty sampling is just taking the observation at the current highest posterior variance of the GP. So the immediate difference you note is that uncertainty sampling spends an inordinate amount of time sampling at the corners, because actually uh, that's where the uncertainty of the function tends to be the highest if you have an embedding, and that tends to inflate the uncertainty out towards the edges. Um, our approach, by contrast, does seem to sort of lock down what the embedding is by spacing its samples out more sensibly. And on the right here, I've got the uh, true embedding as the black dots. Note that you get this interesting character of there being multiple true embeddings. There's symmetries in the space as well as the posterior that our approach obtains after having taken all those black dots over on the left. And you can see that the posterior really is concentrated around the truth, just as you might hope. So now we're to some more realistic examples. We tested this in up to 320 dimensions um, by mapping down to an intrinsic dimension of two. And we were able to get um, you know, quite impressive performance in learning about this function. Note that we haven't actually done Bayesian optimization here. We were just trying to see how well we could learn about a function um, that did have this low intrinsic dimension. So our vision was that this kind of procedure might serve as an um, initial uh, learning phase to a later Bayesian optimization. You might want to spend your initial samples of an objective function learning about a low dimensional embedding ahead of then using that low dimensional embedding to effectively optimize it. I'm very short of time, so I might skip over the um, final point I wanted to make. But fortunately, it's a quick one, which is very simply, uh, I've spent most of this talk on learning, that is, optimizing models, optimizing the hyperimals of models. But of course, as a card-carrying Bayesian, I'm forced to say that inference beats learning. That is, it's almost always better to average over models than to set the parameters to particular values. Now, the really interesting thing is, if you're using Bayesian optimization for learning, it's actually a trivial change to instead do inference in its place. And the reason for that is that, let me skip over this. Um, if you've got a Gaussian process over your log likelihood already, you can use that Gaussian process to come up with a full posterior distribution over the integrals that you would need to do in order to marginalize over those parameters. And that whole process is known as Bayesian quadrature. So it's the exact analog of Bayesian optimization where instead of using the Gaussian process for an objective function and then using that um, Gaussian process to drive its optimization, we take the Gaussian process for an integrand and use that to um, learn about the integral. But if the objective function you're using is already a likelihood, why not instead switch to a Bayesian quadrature view and use the Gaussian process you've already fitted to produce a full posterior distribution for the integrals of interest? So I'm out of time, but um, <laughs> I wanted to finish on the slide I began on. and. Um, Partly that's to have this nice closure of the talk. But also the major takeaway I, I really wanted you to emerge with is this URL, probabilistic-numerics.org. You can also get there by going to probnum.org. This beautiful framework that Philip and I have described has been applied in manifold contexts, everything from optimization to quadrature to linear algebra. And my hope is that you will make this website your new home. I hope that once you visit it, you'll never leave. It'll be just like you know, moving into it with your family and finding it a well-stocked fridge, um, not so much like getting into the back of a van with a man with face tattoos, but 
nonetheless, um, visit the website. If you think that any of your current work is suited to this kind of agenda, send it through to us. We'd love to host it on the website. If you'd like to write blog posts, we'd happily host them again. And um, yeah, more or less, we're trying to use this as the hub of this new community we're growing. We'd love for you to be part of it. So thank you very much. seven minutes for questions. So I, I'm sure there's a lot of questions, so please. And then questions can devolve into discussion. Yeah. As well. so, yeah. Nando, do you want to start? <laughs> 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 so I'll pick on the, on the randomness. Yeah. Uh, um, I think randomness is a nice shortcut. I mean, there's a lot of work in randomized algorithms that sort of mm. gives us a lot. But uh, actually, I'm going to stop there, because I, 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 I um, so for a lot of, you know, if you take an MNIST neural network, for example, and make the weights random, it works just as well. Right. Um, if you just tune the output ones. Um, if you do the same thing on ImageNet, then you'll see that there's a performance gate to be adapted hmm. uh, to doing inference properly. Um, so I think in the end, of course, adaptive <laughs> algorithms will win. It, it's, it's obvious. Hmm. Um, but of course, it will come with computing cost, hmm. whereas randomness these are really cheap algorithms. So, Philip, did you want to answer that? Okay, okay. Yeah, right. So, well, the first thing I'd say is that <laughs> if the problem you're solving is solved by randomness, you didn't even need to do randomness, right? I mean, if you could really just throw darts and get a good enough result, you can do even simpler things than having to spin up a random number generator. I mean, you may as well evenly space your points, or, you know, there, there are many deterministic strategies which would solve the same problem even cheaper than this kind of arbitrary. Well, given a problem in a billion dimensions, let's mm. say, mm. Um, so then you just use, use the first deterministic one that comes up. So yeah. Yeah, I think the problem with this with this idea of pseudo-randomness is, so, so basically these, these theorems that you're quoting, if I understand correctly, are saying, if I use a randomized algorithm with random numbers, then it's gonna, it, it'll have a, a, a polynomial time algorithm. And if I use the deterministic representation of that random number generator, that's not gonna work. So if I tell you the seed I used for my number generator, the algorithm is not going to work. But if I'm not telling you the seed, mm. it's going to work. That seems like pseudo science to me. Yeah, I'd agree um, with that. It's not pseudo science. It's one of the key results in theory of number science. Yeah, we're talking about randomized algorithms versus yeah. deterministic algorithms. But, um, but so maybe to me, I'm something else by deterministic than we do. Okay. Maybe that might be the misunderstanding. No, I'm talking about the theoretical result. I'm not talking a practical about the practical result. That you have to use a pseudo random generator in your computer. That's sort of outside this argument. We're talking about the theoretical um, argument. So, assuming there is a true source of randomness, mm. then we know, given the true I mean, there source, isn't, right? there, no, there's, but as Mike said, there is a source code that provides the problem. There's nothing random about it. I, I would think most of these theoretical arguments to if me use randomness. If, is random. <laughs> <laughs> if there is a source of randomness in the universe, um, then they are, then there exists an algorithm that is polynomial time. If that source does not exist. Then there's n there does not exist any algorithm that will allow you to compute um, a volume in high dimensions given R of mm. uh, A couple of points in response. The first is that I think most of these theoretical arguments, most of these theoretical arguments use randomness as a crutch. That is, that they just use randomness as a means of giving you a probability distribution. But we can get that probability distribution by representing it as the result of epistemic ignorance. There's no need for us to actually inject pseudo-randomness into the algorithm we use in practice, right? It's okay for us to acknowledge in the course of us doing that proof, completing that proof, that we're uncertain about our future actions. I'm okay with that. But when it comes to actually implementing something in practice, why inject more uncertainty into a procedure that's trying to reduce uncertainty? I mean, that makes no sense to me. For I computation mean, and storage, I mean, the whole of the literature of hashing and randomized algorithms, yeah. sketches, is based on this. It's yeah. You, you introduce, ran you introduce yeah. randomness. Yeah, I know I'm a heretic. But I, I, do this I acknowledge that. But ways of reducing mm -hmm. some sort of cost, whether it be compu computation, whether it be storage in the case of sketches. Mm. So it's a very different way of thinking. It's This randomness is not like when you... It's not the statistical way about the, of thinking of things. It's more about trading resources. Yeah, but you should be trading those resources optimally, not randomly. 
I mean, you should be defining what your desired outcome is, setting that up as a loss function, putting a probability distribution over the likely results of your actions, and then minimizing your expected what, loss. What, 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 if you don't, what if you don't know? So you, my favorite example is the one that, like, basically, that Mike got to at the end is plot the So if you integrate a one-dimensional function, you could draw random locations to evaluate it, and then your estimator will converge to like one over the square root of the number of evaluations. Mm. Or you could evaluate on a regular grid and do the trapezoidal rule, which costs the exact same because it's just a sum over a number of numbers, right? It's actually cheaper because you don't have to draw random numbers first. And that will converge linearly fast. Mm. So it's mm -hmm. sort of twice as fast in, in, uh, in simple things. The other important point is the one that yeah. Philip brought up I is. I know the yeah. argument. I mean, yeah. I spend quite a lot of time trying to design deterministic samplers, for example. So, so, yeah. so I, I, I can appreciate the argument for going deterministic. And I know you'll get better results if you go that way. Mm. Um, but what I'm trying to point out is that there's impediments um, sometimes because you, know, you might not know what the solution is or you might not know um, how to do it properly. So I, I don't know how to run arbitrary Monte Carlo, for example, using just a, a deterministic, uh, coming up with a deterministic Monte Carlo algorithm. I know how to do a randomized. In some cases, I know how to build a deterministic Monte Carlo algorithm, and I exploit yeah. that because it will have one over t as opposed to one over the square root t convergence. Yeah. Well, if you do it in a Bayesian quadrature way, you can get exponential convergence. So that's what I'd recommend you actually do which is fully well, deterministic. If, if yeah. it was such a good thing since 1970, since mm. Love introduced it, everyone, all of us would be using it. Mm. So, so you asked this question, why isn't everyone using quadrature? Um, mm. Can I ask you that question? Sure, well, so we don't have the right models for quadrature yet, I would say. I, I mean, we do need to do better at using the right Gaussian processes for high dimensions. I don't think we have those Gaussian processes, but they will exist. I think it's the same problem we're tackling in Bayesian optimization. I'm not sure we've really got the right acquisition functions yet either. But even, I mean, we have this proof now that even for the naive models we're using now, um, well, sorry, even the naive acquisition functions we're using now, and under admittedly the strict restriction that the functions drawn from your RKHS, we get exponential convergence using Bayesian quadrature. So we have those results now. I mean, we see it in practice. But to deploy more broadly on realistic applications, we do need to think a little bit harder about how to get the right performance in high dimensions. And as a caveat to that, I would say, actually, the best thing to do in high dimensions is exactly the probabilistic numeric approach of exploiting structure. And you've seen this yourself in Rambo, in bringing the knowledge of that there is a linear embedding. You can do much, much better than something that doesn't have that bit of knowledge. Linear embeddings are the, aren't the right low dimensional structure for all settings, but there are such low dimensional structures. We should express what they're likely to be in you know, use our algorithms to discover them. Maybe it might be more gainful answer to that. The very same paper by Bryce Lava maybe could, could, could be argued to introduce Gaussian processes as well. And 40 years later, we're still using neural networks. <laughs> people are using neural networks. Annoyingly. And actually, I think for the exact same reason. Because if the space is extremely high dimensional, the number of data points is extremely large, then we're, we're currently struggling to find efficient algorithms for GPs that perform as well as the neural networks. That doesn't mean that the GPs are the wrong models. It just means that they are, they are, they are mathematically more taxing, so we need to, to spend more brain time to make them mm. work. They're mathematically much less taxing. They're algorithmically Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a better choice of words. Yeah, it's a better choice of words. Yeah. 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 Mathematically, they're beautiful. They're neural networks. <laughs> 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 they're not hideous. <laughs> algorithmically, they're clips. <laughs> Can I make one more point about randomness, which is that... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you love it. You love it. Come on. So ju just to bring up Philip's point from before, I mean, one person's randomness is not the same as another person's randomness, right? I mean, randomness is epistemic to some extent. I mean, you can be more or less random, more or less uncertain about the outcome of an algorithm. And to me, it seems very weird that, as Philip said, if I tell you what the random seed is for your pseudo-random number generator, that algorithm is no longer appropriate. I mean, that is a very odd character for a numerical algorithm to have. Um, so, you know, I, instead we should be characterizing the epistemic uncertainty we really should have and designing appropriate priors, I guess. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> that, that wasn't an, an appeal for applause. Yeah. Um, did, yeah, <laughs> did you ask for other questions? Um, or should we open the conversation uh, a bit more? Um, broader than the, I mean, I'm just impressed with how much time 
man that spent defending randomized projections, which seemed yeah. like the dumbest first thing you could ever consider <laughs> doing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but... Yeah. And I'm sure it's great that they work, but... <laughs> <laughs> and, and until we wait for someone to figure <laughs> out how to do this GP properly and adapt it in high dimensions with structures with many layers of the neural networks, mm. do we stop doing stuff? No, do no, no, I think it's fine. I think, I think it's just like what it's illustrating to me, was that I like really the way Mike put it, is that all you're doing is you're trying to put what Mike was doing, pushing that into the covariance function, which then just shows us again, once again, this is actually all about priors of what really these functions are. And that problem you mentioned, why don't people use Brazing quadrature in high dimensional spaces? Well, that's the same thing. We don't have the right structural priors over those high dimensional spaces for optimization or quadrature. So the sort of statements we'd like to make about those high dimensional spaces, we're, we're not currently making particularly well with these mathematically elegant mm. processes. And that's, I think that's a big you know, area, that's a sort of general area probably affect the whole school as well. You know, in some sense, um, we know that neural networks are not doing this well. Why do we know neural networks are not doing this well? We know they're not doing this well because they are very data inefficient. So uh, unless you go to a Bayesian neural network, you need enormous amounts of data to get the neural network to perform. So there's actually a challenge, there's a gap there where we don't have methods that place good structural priors over these spaces, <coughs> these high dimensional spaces. Um, and uh, and neither we're not doing it in Gaussian processes with our mathematical elegance, and they're not really doing it in neural networks because they don't propagate the uncertainty very well. And I think that that, um, that to me goes to the heart of some of the issues that we've just been discussing. So mm. Neil, how would you like to structure the remaining discussion? Well, I thought we'd just throw it out to some more general. There seemed to be a question that was an emerging question. Sorry, I didn't get that. When should I choose samples and when should I choose? Right. So, I mean, there are different acquisition functions used in the two different settings. In yeah. 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 Oh, well, so I would very obviously go for quadrature when I'm trying to learn about an integral, and I would go for optimization when I'm trying to solve a decision problem, when I'm trying to choose the action that minimizes my expected loss. Yeah. For example, when you're looking at hash transitions and stuff like that, you can put the body through the ratio, but that kind of is, does, does that mean you need more samples to get a, a stronger confirmation of the function to, to actually quadrature? Right, like okay. That, when that, is, that is an interesting point. So in quadrature, obviously, we need to do global exploration. We need to resolve our uncertainty about the integrand at all points in the domain in a way we don't necessarily need to do for optimization. So in optimization, you can get away, if you're lucky, with just taking a few samples in the region of what looks like a really good local minima. But for quadrature, you always need to ensure that you've adequately explored the entire space. Yeah. Um, I just thought maybe uh, for the speakers all sit at the front, then we oh. can sort of uh, uh, make it more this discussion. Right? Have, I missed, have I need another chair? Right. Yeah, Yeah, so so there, there's a lot of stuff we know about likelihoods that could potentially be get fed into the covariance function of a GP. The first is that likelihoods are non-negative. And so we've spent a couple of papers now trying to design methods of approximately representing non-negativity with Gaussian processes. The other is that um, 
if you have access to the source code of the likelihood, as I was beginning to discuss before, there are characteristics you might want to incorporate into your kernel. So one of those is um, conditional dependence. Some parameters might only be relevant depending on the others. You can also detect, uh, sorry, detect things like periodicity in the likelihood, like, for example, that likelihood of a periodic model I expressed before. Um, yeah, I, I mean, there's no end to things you can potentially d discover from the source code of the likelihood. Yeah, sorry. Oh, I see what you're saying now. There are, yeah, that's an interesting point, and there are connections. So in that example in which I was uh, fitting a periodic GP, I ended up with a periodic likelihood. So that is something you could do immediately. If you knew that your model was periodic, you would want to incorporate a periodic term into the uh, GP modeling its likelihood function. Not something we've thought much about, but I, much, I would imagine there are many other connections of that type. <laughs> so bear that in mind as you think of your questions. The one that most people want to work. So you're saying with the report that you're going to have to explore more of the face. Yeah. But just to be absolutely clear, that problem uh, of the cursed dimensionality is suffered by anything that's trying to do integration in high-dimensional spaces, including Monte Carlo, including any kind of variational technique. All of, these in, all of these techniques for inference, in one way or another, have to tackle that problem of uh, finding lower-dimensional structure in high-dimensional spaces in order to be effective for inference for high-dimensional models. <coughs> including optimization, right? So optimization isn't free of that. It's, yeah, that is true, but it's, it suffers from it less. I mean, you don't have to have the same degree of global knowledge for optimization as you do for quadrature. But the more you want to sort of guarantee that you find a, a uh, global optimizer, you, there, and there are theorems, and you can also see this in practice, you do need to do more exploration. So um, it, it, the, the sort of more um, you're saying, I, I really need a global optimum, the more you sort of move towards uh, this sort of situation, because you have to basically guarantee that you know this place that I've looked, there isn't an, an optimum hiding there. Yeah. Although it's a li it's still I mean it's true that optimization is still fundamentally easier than integration. Simply because so if if if, I, yeah. if if you could condition your function on the, on knowing that a certain point is the global optimum, then you're done, right? Well. For the, for the integral, you need to know the function value everywhere because you're summing it up. Mm. This, but the, one of the things that's, that's interesting about this is going back to something that Mike said earlier. If you want to do a decision problem, you actually end up wanting to do an optimization anyway. Yeah. And within that decision problem, often the inference step is there as an inner loop. And actually that might focus down where you should be trying to understand your uncertainty. And I think that this is one thing that's missing. You know, nice pictures you guys did earlier, that actually we, you do want to do quadrature when you're doing your, all your uncertainty, but the truth is, we've, at the end of the day, we're going to make a decision, and that might focus the optimizer, the yeah. integration, yeah. but we don't really have good processes for communicating that information across the stages at the moment. We like to separate everything. Um, Thanks, Neil. Yeah. yeah, no, you're absolutely right, and of course, that's one of the big motivations for probabilistic numerics is propagating uncertainty throughout all elements of a numerical pipeline, and the goal is that we can do exactly what you've described and having uncertainty from the optimizer influence the actions of the inference engine, and yeah, that Just would be great. Which, by the way, is the idea behind these silly pictures on the website. Yeah. Kind of creating a factor graph of computation that allows the propagation of this kind of uncertainty. Yeah. I've been trying to think of a nice way to phrase this question, but I'm not sure which method. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if it's going to come up. It's very clear. But um, given these sort of ideas, in the same way that, say, for communications, you'd have Shannon's law, or you'd have some first circuit law, in the same way, we, we know things like, if you take a neural network to compute something, and if we, if we say, hypothetically, that's a debate model for the brain, which is about efficiency, we know that our implementation on the computer of it is massively inefficient, even if it performs in a similar performance than, say, the brain, in terms of the number of watts or something like that. So if we're talking about actual computational effort, and maybe that's on one axis, and on the other axis is some metric, maybe the metric is reduction in uncertainty about something. 
do we think that from methods like this, this leads to some surface, and then some algorithms and some techniques live on this surface, and some mm. do not, in terms of if you had a way, if I had 17 methods of computing the same answer, and we're saying I want you to be most efficient about it, is it the case that, what, that I, can I get arbitrarily close to it, or I was just thinking from, from your from work of saying, if I'm going to treat my deterministic future as mm. an uncertainty, as an uncertain thing, because it's computationally easier, mm. like there comes a trade-off when that's not true. If my, if my likelihood function was really easy, then I could optimize, marginalize, optimize, marginalize, would be simpler than forming a actual process of it. So that, that must mean that at some point there's a transition between the two. And does that live on the surface? Is that some new... So uh, there's at least, at least there's no simple answer to that. Um, because it's difficult, I think, to phrase that right. So one, one, one problem is that the, the, the efficiency of the computation is relative to the, or what, what computation you should choose is relative to the prior knowledge you have about the solution of the problem. Um, and that prior knowledge somehow has this interplay with computation in the sense that we have to phrase the, the algorithm in a language that allows sort of certain steps to become analytic. So for example, in quadrature, qu quadrature is, again, it's the, the univariate quadrature is, the, is a wonderful example case because everything is so nice and clean and straightforward. So it, what quadrature rules do is they project the intractable integral onto a space of integrable functions, which somehow lies dense in the, in the space, like, well, the, which, which covers a region around the true integrand. And then you can spend computational resources to narrow down this, this uh, posterior. So, you could become better and improve the performance of your algorithm by choosing a, a better embedding. And in particular, you could become better by like, somehow discovering a smart basis that you know how to integrate in closed form. So basically, I think sort of the, this limit surface you are asking for is, in that sense, is similar to the surface of all analytically integrable functions. And I don't know what that is, right? So, so you could, I, I could claim that a certain function is not analytically integrable, and you can come along tomorrow and say, well, I've figured it out. It might be more subtle than that, in that I'm not, if we're, if we're, if we're going into this problem of merits, and I'm going to say, well, I'm not going to, I don't necessarily want the answer. I want a, a trade-off, and that I'm prepared to expend this much effort, but I, well, I, want, my, I want my uncertainty about it reduced by this mm. much. How much effort must I expend in order so what there probably does exist, and that's actually a really cool question, is uh, a form of sort of Shannon's source coding statement that given the prior information you have about the, like if you, once you condition on, like once you fix sort of how you encode your prior information about the numerical problem, then yeah, there is probably an optimal kind of statement. <laughs> uh, doesn't this also, one thing I think when, when uh, Mike was, uh, well, when these points were coming across in the talks earlier, one thought that was occurring to me is that there's no difference in this and what we do with data anyway. Mm. Data is a different type of mm. computation. You know, in some sense, you will never get the answer you want. So that's yeah. some absolute truth. Bayesian inference conditions on given this data set, this is what I can say. And uh, of course, if you say, well, I've got a person I can send out to go and get more data. So it, there's a, the relationship between, it, that's why it's so similar to active learning. You know, mm. it's a cost to acquiring more data, whether it's a computational cost or a payment cost, it's, it's still some sort of cost. And I think one way of describing intelligence is actually decision-making so as to minimize that cost. I think that's mm -hmm. why I was trying to think about definitions of what is intelligence. Yeah. I think intelligence is like, well, use processing power to minimize other energy-based costs. And I, I see, to me, that everything becomes one. It's just people aren't used to that being computational processing power because the normal heavy processing power is human processing power. Mm. So it, it's true that there's a lot of overlap between, like we, we keep discovering that there's an ex a much, much closer overlap between inference and computation than we thought, or between statistics and numerics, or whatever the words are you want to choose. But there is a fundamental difference that I think is actually fundamental, and that is in numerics there is a backstop in the form of the source code that Mike mentioned. There's a, you, you actually have a formal description of the task in the form of a formal language, which sort of there's no more uncertainty beyond that. While in sort of physical statistics, there's kind of an endless philosophical pit uh, to worry about in terms of how random your data actually is. 
right? So, so is, is, the, is the world out there deterministic or not? Is our data actually random or not? What, what, how uncertain are you about the data go, points you're going to get to see? I mean, the point I made like at the beginning of the summer school is you don't need to talk about that. Laplace says the universe is clockwork. You have to use uncertainty because you don't know it. You don't need to go beyond that argument. And you made yeah. it in 1814. Everything that's come since is kind of like <laughs> dancing on the head of a pin. Because what he says is true, whether the universe is fundamentally random, and you only have to take that philosophy to approach it. So, so I, I agree with that, but, it, but it's very difficult to test against that because we don't know what the machine of the universe is. While for the integration, we know what the machine is. We, we know mm. that the integrand yeah, looks you know, like this. this. Philosophical <coughs> I mean, the math remains Yeah, it's, it's totally philosophical, yeah. yeah. It's <laughs> philosophical. Well, it, it, up, up to the point of you, you can actually do that. You can look at the source code and you could think of a parser that comes up with a numerical method par having parsed the source code. You cannot parse the source code of the universe. It's just fundamentally not going to happen. I would like to I, uh, repeat a bit more. Because, I mean, it's a, it's a practical thing because, say, like, Hansoga had this thing when he's a bit out there, but he always has this thing about. I find that fascinating. So that if I could restate your idea, it's that having passed the source code already so as to do inference with it later, um, whatever features are detected in the program could actually be used to inform how the program should be rewritten. Maybe I could corrupt the program in some way, make the likelihood cheaper by leaving out the expensive bits of the computation if I detected that they didn't seem to be influencing the output too much. So you could kind of rewrite your likelihood on the fly. Yeah. That would be super cool. Yeah. I think that's an umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> you don't decide on that. <laughs> I'm just suggesting. <laughs> <laughs> I would like to nominate an umbrella question. Uh, it kind of sounds a bit related to the this multi level Monte Carlo idea of assuming that you need to talk to this, so you've got to, you want to estimate some um, expectation, and you've got some underlying simulator that has uh, very different resolutions. And so you know you've got a certain amount of approximation at the end, and so you're going to kind of trade off by running a very different coarsenesses to try and scale up so you don't waste effort. So, so people have sort of something similar in. I think that the nice thing that uh, emerges now is actually by analyzing the program, I guess the difference here is you're seeing where the computational cost is within that program. So I'm sort of super into, I think that deep learning is all about obtaining the right automatically learning the abstraction. Mm. But here the abstraction is saying, well, in the likelihood this portion of the code is costing me an enormous amount in terms of computation, and then I could replace it just with assume that's Gaussian, because mm. it doesn't really affect things, and then everything will run cheaper. So it's just sort of computation. Active profiling or something yeah, like active that? Active profiling. Yeah. Can I say something about deep learning? <laughs> 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 so in deep learning, there is this view. Um, if you take, the, say, the type of models that we use now with 60 layers or so, so very deep uh, models, um, solving complex tasks, um, I, I guess first there is a view that indeed we're using a lot of, uh, in, in some tasks we are using more data than we 
should be using. We want to reduce sample complexity. Um, it's, it's also clear to us that um, in, in some cases, the type of discriminants we're, we're obtaining do not protect us against some very stupid mistakes. And there's been a few papers out there. However, it's also understood that these stages are stages of computation. And that the data, how you handle data, how you look at regularities, regularities of data are intermingled with computational steps. And it is also well understood that these are inference steps. No one will argue that computation and inference are not the same thing in this machine. Um, and it is also true that as these models are learning, they attend. So if you take the derivatives of a, uh, output layers of Cognet or any neuron with respect to other units, you can see how it attends very smartly to certain things. Um, the type of neural networks that we've trained, for example, for games and so on, um, they actually attend to the interesting parts of the game. So the computation is actually very local already in the way that derivatives are propagated and so on. But that is emerging. That locality is emerging and it's being governed by data. Um, so, so these ideas that the wasteful, so it's not entirely, they're not entirely wasteful and they're not entirely sort of all like brute force. Mm. Um, they're doing very smart things. So I don't dispute that. I don't. Right. <laughs> yeah, I think the worry is it takes quite a lot of data to get them to do that. That would be why people. I mean, so the big question is like, you know, if neural networks are so brilliant, why aren't they used to train neural networks? And okay, they can be, but only if you use Bayesian actually, neural networks, actually where you actually are. start pushing it towards. Uh, actually, they are. So but the dominant, the dominant framework for training neural networks is Gaussian processing. And so my joke is, well, that's only because if you've got neural networks to train them, then you'd hit the AI singularity. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it makes no sense. I mean, there's an enormous amount of uncertainty when you're, you can only do a few training runs. When you've got scarce data, you need things that can sustain uncertainty. And the fundamental problem with the standard neural networks, and people like a deep mind are working on this, is they don't push the uncertainty through the model. And, and that's, I think, where, that's where, why, well, that's where with Gaussian processes you tend to be better in certain tasks because you can push the uncertainty through the model. The problem is pushing uncertainty through something is much harder than pushing a gradient through. And so in practice, we struggle a lot more with algorithms to get them, these sort of odd structures to stay. But I don't think anyone's disputing that these are interesting structures. It's just um, they don't um, learn very efficiently um, in terms of they require enormous amounts of data. And a lot of the tasks people are interested in, you can't get that quantity. They're learning a lot more than any teacher is learning in certain <laughs> They can't. They, so no, 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 no one's, no one's disputing that. But so the, 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 it's, it's not what the, the, I don't think. No one is disputing that. The problem is that there are many, many tasks that there's not enough data to train a deep neural network on, and yet the structure that a deep neural network gives you is something that you want to apply to those tasks. And deep neural networks do not perform well. I mean, everyone in this whole debate, like we tried these things in 1997. Why didn't they work? We didn't have enough data or compute. It wasn't that we didn't have the algorithms. Jan had the algorithms. We just didn't have the data. On MNIST, they were beaten, well, they were got uh, run close by much, much simpler algorithms. And it was purely the bias variant, bias variant dilemma coming out for those models. Why they're now active is because we've got a massive amount of data. But that's great for people who have a lot of data in industry. But I mean, for personalized health, we don't have that data. And we're never going to get it because the complexity of our health is far more complex than what a cat looks like. Um, that's a very simple thing. Yet we require millions and millions of images to sort it out. So you know we we can't be in that position for things like health. Um, and so no one disputes that those architects are good, but there is a need for these sort of uncertainty propagating architectures to come through. And I think probabilistic numerics is saying that from one side. I think it very much from just the modeling side. Sorry, that's too much from me. <laughs> <laughs> can't have too much of you, Neil. Yeah. <laughs>
sorts of methods. There, in in some ways, uh, the the problem is easier when when you have something that's not continuous, and and in other ways, it it is harder. Um, and so, in fact, I, I I mentioned the bandit problems. These are the classical bandit problems um, are exactly those situations where the points you're looking at are uh, independent. Um, and you have some model over each one of these these <coughs> points that you're, you're you could possibly query, um, and that's actually uh, if you have a large number of those points, um, it's easy to sort of uh, e evaluate indices and then take the argmax of that unless they get really large and then you have to do something else. Um, but uh, you can use very similar methods for independent models. It's harder just because evaluating point A versus point C, there's no sort of transfer of information between those two. Whereas the continuous problems, some of the inference steps are, are harder, but the, it may make the optimization easier because you have these sort of uh, smoothness um, uh, assumptions. Okay, so a lot of the results I presented, I, I, I guess I didn't emphasize this, but a lot of the problems I was uh, talking about, they were actually discrete. Yeah, like the LP solved those 47 parameters are 47 binary slides. Um, 